Hi there, we're ready to get started today with today's webinar, Simple Successful Video for Schools. I'm Madeline Sankoski, the Community Manager at Social Media. Welcome to today's online presentation and discussion. Today we will be talking with Justin Malvin of Ed Forward about how to craft successful, affordable videos for your school or organization. If you're tweeting about the webinar today, be sure to include hashtag EdSocialMedia. Feel free to use Twitter as a forum for questions, or you can use the question section in the webinar program on your screen. Justin will be periodically taking as many questions as he can throughout the presentation, so feel free to drop a note whenever it comes to mind, and I'll ask Justin um, when he has a, an, an opening. If all goes according to plan, we will have a recorded version of today's webinar for you to view later, so check back on edsocialmedia.com for our blog post recap and I will also send a follow-up email as well. Um, as a general heads up for today's webinar, Justin will be showcasing a few videos throughout the presentation. Depending on your internet connection, they might not stream seamlessly, so to alleviate any of the frustration, I'll tweet links to the videos as Justin talks about them, so you can view them later at your leisure. I'll also include those links in the blog post and the follow-up email. Um, as for Justin, he uh, was born a child of the LA entertainment industry and has been around television and video since the early years of his life. His first foray into strategy was as a political analyst before spending four years as the primary provider of content and new media research for California's Windward School. Justin now enjoys helping people as an independent consultant. Justin, thanks for bringing all of this together for us today. Oh, thank you very much. I'm really excited about this. This is a uh, this is my favorite topic. This is you know I literally grew up doing this, so it's it's always um, my favorite favorite uh, topic to talk about when it comes to communicating for schools. Um, cool. Well, let's get right into it. The things I'm planning to do today are um, to talk about. Um, First, we're just going to learn how to produce a video in 20 minutes. I'm going to show everybody exactly how the Hollywood professionals do documentary style videos, which is basically the style of video that you shoot for school typically. Um, and we're going to we're going to whip through that in in 20 minutes, and you'll get the essential tools you need to basically produce a video um, as as in as quick a fashion as possible, um, knowing the school environment. I, uh, as the introduction said, I worked in content creation for um, you know an independent school for four years and so I know what it's like to be you I know what it's like to be the person who you know has a million jobs they do for every department on campus um, you know your your sort of workload is, is through the roof and um, everybody's really demanding of you and they want they want better and better content you know, every day, and you're thinking, how in the world am I going to add a video piece? And and that's exactly what the purpose of this this whole discussion is. It's just to show you how to do it. And so we'll start off um, with how to produce the video, like exactly. And I'll give you very simple methods for producing video that looks basically as professional as can be, um, and and more importantly, feels professional because we're going for feel here. Um, and then next, we'll talk about um, how video actually fits into the communication strategy, right? So you don't Video is going to be this tool in your arsenal. You'll have, you know, your slideshows and your written materials, print materials. All this stuff is, is, um, you know, how schools communicate with constituents, both internally and externally. And video is a piece of that pie, and um, and it can be managed accordingly. Um, and then um, after that, I'll I'll just go over the the starter kit. I mean, basically, if you're going from absolute, you know, no progress in video whatsoever, you don't have any gear. I'll give you the pieces that you need to get going. Um, you know, right away, um, the absolute essential equipment you need to buy, and I'll try to recommend different, um, you know, kits for different people with different needs and different levels of budget, right? So the idea is not to push professional setups um, like we use out here. It's the idea is to get stuff that works for you, and more importantly, is comfortable for you to use, as opposed to you know just using professional gear for the sake of wanting the best possible video, um, which we'll get into. But um, let's start right away with the essential elements of video. Video is essentially made up of two shots, two types of shots, especially when we're talking about school videos that are documentary style. There's A roll and there's B roll. And if there's anything you're going to take away from today, that's what I want you to remember. There's A roll and there's B roll. And that is all. They are the be all and end all of video. If you go to a major blockbuster movie, they have 
they call it a master shot, and then a bunch of other secondary shots. But essentially, it's A, B, and then a bunch of other letters that they use for other reasons. But basically, A roll and B roll is all you'll ever need to know to produce good stuff. So first, let's talk about what A-roll is. A-roll is that video that you see when you see a documentary or a news story or something where it's the person talking to the camera, kind of like the shot that I have up now. It's, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a shot where, the, you know, the person is talking, they're giving you narrative, and you're just simply asking them questions and recording audio of their voice from what they're saying and doing about, the, about a topic, right? Um, the essential elements of A-roll is the very most important thing you can learn, and this was taught to me by an LA Times reporter, was that you never want to ask a question that ends in a question mark if you want to get good information. What you're looking to do is give what we call gentle commands. So if you say something to a teacher like, you know, uh, what was the project you guys did, are going to do today in class? What's the project you're going to do today in class? And they'll say something like, well, we're doing letters from history. And you're like, oh, God, okay, I, um, i got to ask, uh, ask your question again because that's not going to work really well for your video. What you want is for them to describe it. So you want to do exactly that. Give them a gentle command. Say, you know, describe, explain, imagine, things like that. So if you say something like, describe the project we're about to see today. They'll say, well, I developed this project, you know, by working with three other departments on campus. It's cross-disciplinary. And what we're looking for, the goal is to give the students you know, a, a, a reenactment of history while at the same time working with their writing skills and blah, blah, blah. And they'll go on and on and on. And this is what you want to do when you're capturing a roll. You know, you want, you want for every um, person that you want to include, you want to have about 20 minutes of this a roll of them just going on and on and on about what, what, their, what the topic is. Even if you're shooting a two-minute video with one person in it, you want to record a good 15 to 20 minutes of question and answer because when you go back to edit later, and this is the first time I'm going to say this and I'm going to hammer this home, you want a lot of source material because a lot of times they'll, you'll get yourself, you'll paint yourself into a corner if you do not have enough source material. And this is an instinct you're going to have to fight and we'll talk about this a little bit more later when we get into B-roll because I'm going to say something really crazy on the B-roll page. Um, so yeah, get used to this idea of giving gentle commands without without question marks, and you know some people call them open-ended questions, but really you want the command part is important. You want them to give the information that you're looking for, and so you'll say you know say things like explain and describe. Okay, from a video standpoint, you want to shoot the stuff off angle. Um, I've got this picture of this guy here. It's a little bit harsh, you know his his angle is a little bit harsh, but in, in general. Um, for documentary style stuff, you don't want to, you don't want the person to stare directly into the camera, because it's totally unnerving to the viewers. And if you can imagine somebody coming up to you, putting their hands on both of your shoulders, and shaking you a little bit, and telling you something right in your face, it's really, really unnerving. Um, and and that is essentially what you're doing if you shoot somebody straight into the camera. You know, if it's a news broadcast and we're watching the 11 o'clock news, they are trying to drill the information straight into you, so they look directly into the camera as if they're talking only to you. But when we're talking about documentary or we're trying to do programmatic video that describes how great, you know, the new chemistry lab is, drilling it straight into a person is really unnerving if what we really want them to do is absorb the feeling of the lab and get this warm and fuzzy feeling. It's, it's, it's very off-putting. Um, in general, you want what we call either a close-up or an ECU, which is an extreme close-up. So we're looking right now at this photo. It's a close-up. It's basically, you know, from chest level up of this person's face. Um, in your case, you won't want a microphone in their face, but, you know, you want, you want this. Or if you're looking for very, a more dramatic effect, let's say it's something that's like really a, you know, something where you really want to see the person's emotion in their face, you can do an extreme close-up, which is, you know, neck to the top of the head or even chin to the top of the head. So we're talking about, you know, just their face. And you'll see that in really dramatic documentaries of things that are trying to be more emotional. So let's say you have a donor or a founder or somebody that you're doing an obituary video or something like that and you want it to be really emotional and intense, you can tighten that screen up so it's more intimate. And that's the whole idea. So you can think of between close-up and extreme close-up as sort of this lever bar you can use for your video's intimacy when it comes to what the speaker is saying. That being said, don't ramp up the intimacy if they're talking about something totally inane, right? <laughs> it'll, be, it'll feel weird. Um, and that's the thing. Also, the next point, something that people do a lot 
is when they get into a conversation with somebody, and the idea of a role interviewing is to make the com feel like a conversation, right? So what you're going to do, like I said, you're going to have no questions. But really, what you're going to do is you're going to have a conversation that's split into essentially three parts. You're going to have about two or three minutes of just just absolute small talk with the person because what if you start shooting right when the camera's rolling and you say, okay, we're recording now, and you hit go, I guarantee you they're going to freak out because people aren't used to being on camera, especially teachers and things that, you know, they're not, they're not actors or whatever. They don't, they're not used to being exposed like that. Um, so so you're, you're, you're going to get into this conversation with them with the two minutes of just small talk while the camera rolls, okay? Yeah, you can fast forward, forward past it later. It might seem like a waste of space, but it's necessary to get them comfortable with the idea of the camera being on. So just talk about whatever. I mean, literally anything. Oh, how's your morning? How'd you get here? I was traffic. Whatever. Um, and then you get into the meaty piece where you actually get into your gentle command. If you, when you get good at this, it'll be slick. Oh, man, yeah, the weather's, the weather's great today. I'm glad I got a break. Um, anyway, oh, I guess we should start talking about the project. Tell me about, and boom, and you go right into it, and it's a very smooth transition for them. And they just are already in the mood to chat with you, and they'll just spill to the camera. And you can literally navigate the geography of their thoughts from then on because they're an open book and you're using general commands and you can just paw your way through you know, what they're thinking and feeling and capture as much of this rich information as possible. And then more importantly, when you're done with the information you're trying to get, don't just shut the camera off and say thanks and leave because then they'll, they might feel a little weird about that or they might feel a little insecure on the back end and they'll never stop hassling you until they see the video, which is another problem you're trying to avoid, right? This is all about saving time. So, you know, leave a big follow-up at the end where you, you, again, go into small talk or keep discussing it, and you ease your way out of the conversation. So with those three pieces in mind, here's the important thing to remember, and this is why it says no talking at the bottom of this slide. When you get into the question and answer section, you will have this urge to talk to, to the person as if you had been for the last few minutes doing your small talk. Make sure that when you answer the question, when you ask them a question or send them a gentle command, you stop talking. Otherwise, your own voice will be at the beginning of every piece of audio that you want to cut. And that will drive you insane. Um, so you, and you won't be able to use a lot of it because your own voice will be over it. So don't hum. Don't say, uh-huh. Don't say anything. It's going to feel weird. But when they're responding to you, just smile and do gestures with your face and everything and just make like a mime and try to encourage them with your eyes and your emotion. But don't make any noise. Otherwise, you know, when, they're, when you're cutting your video, you'll get, yeah, so this program is, you know, designed to help the students navigate through history. And you go, uh-huh. And that's, like, totally unusable, and you'll know that the second you get into editing. So if you do this right the first time, you won't have any trouble editing, and that's what we're trying to do, save you from the dreaded two-day edit session. Um, so that's A-roll in a nutshell. Um, let me go through B-roll, and then I guess I'll circle around for questions and then. That's probably a good idea. B-roll is pretty simple. Okay, now here's the crazy part. There's a, you want an, a half hour to an hour of B-roll for every minute of video that you're planning to produce, okay? So it sounds insane, but I promise you if you don't do this, you will have the two-day edit session. It will take you a week if it's your first video to make the video look even halfway decent because if you run out of source material, You'll have nothing to choose from. You want a bucket of source material so big, you can't even believe how much extra footage you have. And you can go back in future videos and use the stuff you didn't use in this video. Okay. Again, look at the photographs. We have two types of B-roll video. There's basically like on the left, we have you know shots of people being active and doing things that are on the topic. Um, so if it's a video about making lunches for homeless people, um, which is like a a community service thing a lot of schools do, you can, you know, you can show images of the kids putting the stuff in the bag or whatever and stuff like that. So that's, you know, that's on action B-roll. That's, that's B-roll of people doing stuff. The other type of B-roll on the right here is what we call establishing shots and stuff like that. It's a little more advanced, but basically if you can imagine the end of the video, you want to say, yeah, so now we're going to deliver these lunches to the, you know, to the people in our community and the kids walk off into the sunset, basically. So the shots are far away. They basically establish the mood and everything like that. And that's just a little bit of icing on the cake. 
you know, if you never ever shoot an establishing shot of your whole life, you'll probably be okay. But the action video, the B-roll on the left of what, you know, you shoot B-roll of what the person is talking about. So first, you shoot a bunch of A-roll. And if you're not going to shoot A-roll first, you shoot a lot, a lot of B-roll because you're not going to be sure what the person is talking about. But in an ideal situation, you start with A-roll, and they say, oh, yeah, this project is about, you know, kids, you know, learning about history and getting them to engage with both writing and critical thinking at the same time. Aha! I need to shoot B-roll of that happening. If you can't do it in that order, which you won't always be able to, you need a ton of B-roll because they can say anything. They can say, oh, well, this was really about, you know, helping them incorporate their ideas and collaborating together. Oh, my God. I've only shot images of kids working alone. That kills me if they say collaboration. I either have to go back and reshoot or go back and re-interview, and it's a time suck. Right? So if we want to do this smoothly, try to get A-roll first, and if not, you definitely want to shoot an hour of B-roll per minute of video because you don't know what they're going to say in A-roll, and you need a shot that matches what they're talking about. Um, so shoot a ton of the stuff on the left, and if you have time, shoot some stuff on the right because it will just make it sweeter and more, you know, um, a sugary thing to watch, easier just, you know, more creative. Um, that being said, uh, motion stills can bail you out, right? So all of the editing programs now have the ability for you to put in a still image instead of video. Um, you know, you can if you if you if you miss on your B-roll and you have a hole, you could use still photography, which is a lot easier to capture, um, and it's a lot easier to pretend like something's happening in a photo that may not have happened. So you could go back and shoot a photo three days later to cover a hole. And even if the kids are doing a different assignment, nobody will know, right? So that's this is all about bailing yourself out. Um, so you can you can use these motion stills, and they'll they'll get you out of a jam there. Um, there is something called the Ken Burns effect. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. It, it has to do with making a motion still look more alive by cutting it into layers. If you're good at using motion stills and you're listening to this, I highly recommend looking into this Ken Burns thing and seeing what it is, because it can make it a little bit cooler. Um, and if you're used to putting in stills, you can you can use the time you have built up by being quick at putting in stills and you know give a little back to the idea of doing a Ken Burns, which will take you about three times as long, but if you're fast, it's cool. Um, so that is about it. Before we go on to music, let's, let's pull over to the side of the road and see if we have any questions. Madeline, do we have any questions about A-roll or B-roll or anybody? It doesn't look like we... Okay, we don't cool. have any questions chiming in yet. Um, I do have one question, just talking about A-roll a little bit and being in this market. Sometimes you get some really quiet kids. Uh -huh. So I like your idea of the um, the soft and quiet commands, but how might you get like the kids going a little more if you're looking for more of a response from someone that's a little bit more shy? We'll get the kids in a second. They're a special deal. Right now we're talking about students. I have a whole a whole spiel just about, just about kids and how to work with them. Um, because Perfect. I I bet that there's um, a few there's a few pitfalls that people fall into and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so let's go on to a big question, which is always a big huge controversy whenever we talk about this, is music. A lot of times in videos, it's um, you're either going to go without music or or just put music under the whole thing. I haven't seen a lot of people doing what we call sound up and sound down. So like music shows up, it plays for a while, and it goes away, kind of like a movie. It's hard to make that stuff smooth, so people usually avoid it. They either lay down music the whole time and just let it run to kind of keep the video fresh, or they just won't use it because the video is short enough that it doesn't hurt too bad to listen to just people talk for a while, um, or natural audio. Um, so, but it, if you're going to use music, uh, make sure that you cut the music to the length that you want, and and not just lay down a whole pop music track and lay it down. Um, if, as long as you're, you're, you're going to select music, select music that has moments that you can cut on, right? So you want music, you know, that's called on-action music, where you can, you can drop and edit right when there's a change in the music or something like that, right? So if it's a long piece or something that, you know, kind of is really just smooth or, or it, it doesn't have a good place for you to drop and edit and it's hard to cut, it'll make it difficult to lay images over the top, and especially speech, because it'll give you n nothing to anchor your edits on. Um, music is a lot of time the backbone of an entire piece. So you know what people will more frequently do than not is take a piece of music they like, 
cut it up according to the guidelines I'm about to give you and lay that down and then lay the speech and the images, you know, the A roll and the B roll over the top of that. So you want a piece of music that gives you nice, you know, big chunks that you can cut on or definite mood changes so that you can you can it's easier it's just easier to edit the piece in general. Um, so definitely cut the music and cut it down for length. You never want to run a whole piece. And you want to use on action music. You want the music to be upbeat but not intrusive, right? I would never use hardcore hip hop for a piece that had any type of message to send at all besides, you know, maybe a basketball video or something where we just dominated. <laughs> you know, there's no you don't want to use music that's overbearing or basically stands alone because people will start listening to the track and they won't be able to even understand what you're doing. Or you'll have to turn it down so low, it's just annoying. Um, you want music that appeals to everybody. This is pretty basic, but I've seen a lot of videos where this doesn't happen. So just make sure that when you're putting it together, you want music that will appeal to everybody. The reason for that is when you send this thing up the chain, schools have a way of having about 20 people that have to approve a video. Right? When you go to put out a video, they're so rich and they're so impactful that everybody in the world, I mean, board members will be jumping in on your videos the next thing you know. So you want to make sure that it's a piece of music that is really, really universal and really is just okay for everybody. Um, otherwise, it's one, and all it takes is one, you know, big board member to be like, yeah, that doesn't sound very school-like or that doesn't sound very appropriate. And boom, you're having a huge re-edit. And if you if you built the piece around the music and something like that happens, it is an absolute catastrophe. It's a recut that's as long as the original cut. So just make sure that you're using stuff that won't get you in trouble later. And then also, if possible, drop the lyrics. Um, I was just talking about this with my friend Noel Becker at Harbor Day School this morning, literally. Um, and she we you know she was asking me what to do with a Jason Mraz piece. And this gets into the rights thing, okay? People ask me all the time about using using copywritten music for school pieces. Here's the, the straight dope on that. Most people who go around chasing right stuff and ASCAP and people like that, and I have friends like that here in LA, if it's an education piece, they usually don't care for two reasons. One is because it's hard to prove that you didn't have educational fair use. So if you use a piece of music and it's in an educational way and you're teaching kids how to do something and you use it for that, it, it falls under like federal fair use. So it's hard to prove that even if the video is online, you didn't use it in an educational way. There wasn't a kid sitting there helping you edit it or whatever. Um, you know, the second thing is you can count the number of views each video gets. And typically if you bought a piece of music, it fits within the presentation license that you get with the song itself, right? So if I buy a movie like, you know, Captain America and I want to show it to a party full of people, that's not infringing. I have a certain amount of rights that comes along with um, buying the video itself. And I think it's like a cap of like a thousand people or something. So I can have a party with up to a thousand people. And if I show Captain America, it's not considered an infringement. In the music world, it's kind of the same thing. I don't think it's written out anywhere. I've never seen it. But basically, if you can prove that you know, if you can get more than 200 people to watch your video, you are killing it. And, you know, ASCAP and BMI, all those guys, they know this. And they don't care if you make a little video and 200 people at your school watch it. They really have bigger fish to fry. They're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to knock out a network of New York bootloggers. bootleggers. They don't care about your, your two-minute school video. Um, that being said, lyrics are managed differently, and they're a lot more touchy. So I would try to cut out lyrics as much as possible. You catch a few here and there, fine. But basically what you want to do is take a piece of music with just the bridge or something where there are no lyrics and loop that sucker over and over again. Nobody will notice. It will drive you crazy in editing, but not a soul will notice it in terms of viewers because they're watching your, they're listening to your speaker speak. Um, the only two exceptions I've ever seen for this are montages that are all B-roll, and we'll get to that in a second, that were just had an entire, entire audio track laid underneath it. Uh, I know one time we were at Windward and we got a bill for one of these things. It was like this intro video to our website and it had the entire piece of music. Ironically, it was written and performed by a former student, so we thought we'd be cool, but not so much. And they sent us a bill for having used this piece of music and it was like $17. 
So I think it's pretty much worth the risk, <laughs> you know. And the other thing is the, the people who will send you a big threatening letter are musical people, okay. So if you're shooting arts, what you definitely, definitely don't want to do is record an entire piece from one of the musical, you know, Fiddler on the Roof, even something ancient, you know, 42nd Street, Fiddler on the Roof, you know, Chorus Line, the oldest musicals there are. If you record a chunk of that stuff and you throw it up on YouTube, they're going to be really upset. And the reason is because they make money from licensing the, these pieces for use at schools. And if you throw up an entire video of your kids performing this, somebody else's music teacher could just watch that video and make their own arrangement and skip having to, you know, to buy the music off of them. And that, they're really sensitive to that. That does affect their market. Um, so so that is the, that is the deal with music. But basically, if you pick a pretty general piece of music, cut out a lot of the lyrics, and cut it down to a minute and a half, two minutes, you're going to be cool. Okie dokie. Um, I put this slide in here just because I can't show live video because I'm not presenting this live. Um, but basically, um, this is basically what a timeline will look like. Um, and... And you can see what's going on here. You have this A roll, which is on video track two here. This is a this is a screenshot of Final Cut Express, and you have you have this this. Um, let's see if my mouse can be seen. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but um, you have this this V two right here, which is A roll. They've gone ahead and cut out the spaces underneath their stills that they've put in and other stuff like that. You don't actually have to do that, um, but you've got your A roll running here. And the video will be going along, and then boom, you'll pop a piece of cover video or a cover image in this case back here, and you'll see this stuff rolling over the top. And what that allows you to do is cut audio underneath your video. So this is what we were talking about, and I will show you a video example that, uh, like Madeline said, will be pretty choppy, but I'll show it to you anyway in a second. Um, and so you're going along. And you have your person talking along, and then all of a sudden you put up an image, and right, as soon as that image hits, you can cut what they're saying right there. That slice is a cut. And as you can see, they've taken what these guys are saying, and they've cut it up, right? So you put this cover image over it, you make a cut, a seamless cut in the audio, and then you can go back to the original video, and it'll look and sound as if nothing happened. It'll look like you just put a graphic up for a second. So this is where this all comes together, and this is like the most important thing, and I'll try to show you a video example of this right now. Um, you got your A-roll, you shoot a bunch of it. You got your B-roll, you shoot a bunch of that, right? Your A-roll is going to have a teacher saying, you know, you'll say, tell me about this project, and they'll say something like, well, this project is really great. It involves a lot of teachers in a lot of different departments, and it's really designed to help the students learn better. So the way I did it, and right here, you're going to get this every time, they'll go into a description of the project itself. Because what the interviewee is doing is they're working out in their mind what is going on. So first they have to, to get it straight in their head, and then they'll give you the, the butter at the end. So they go, yeah, this pr project is really designed to help the students you know, write well and do critical thinking at the same time. So what we did is we got this out and we used this technology and we got Google Docs and blah, 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 and then we decided to do this and then it turned out we wanted to do that and blah, blah, blah. And then they'll say something five minutes later. So in the end, it turned out our students had a wonderful time. They, they really felt the lesson. They learned a lot. And more importantly, they were able to improve their writing, which is critical to every school these days. Boom. That is the magic stuff, right? So if you just had, if you have no B-roll, to, to show the kids doing what they're talking about. You won't be able to get from, yeah, this is a cross-disciplinary project that was really designed to help the students, you know, exercise critical thinking while writing at the same time. Cut. In the end, it worked out that the students had a wonderful time, and they really enjoyed doing it, and more importantly, their writing skills notably improved. Holy Moses. The, perfect just, the person just said the most perfect sound bite in the world. And they will thank you for cutting out all that middle stuff. And if you don't shoot enough B-roll to cover that stuff, you will, you will not be able to do that, right? Now, that's a basic example. Probably what will end up happening is to string together one coherent phrase, you'll have to do like four or five cuts. So you want this B-roll to come over the top and show the kids working on their letters from history or whatever while you're slicing that audio up like a million times. And when that audio is strung together, 
boom. It's going to sound so natural and so easy, and then the video is going to cover it, and then you just come back to the person talking, and it'll seem as if they said it perfectly the first time, which never happens. Um, so, so that's basically the technique you're looking to use. Now let's see if I can show you this video. I got a few videos out from stuff that I produced back in the day from Windward, um, but lots of good people out there have have good videos like this. Um, but I'm just going to show some of this stuff. So this is a video called the Stock Market Simulator. Um, I'll only show a few seconds just to sort of give you the piece because I, I will be jumpy. But I recommend going back and watching it, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, look for B-roll versus A-roll, and um, and look for um, look for you won't be able to hear the cuts in the audio, but um, look for those those two pieces and how you could, how you yourself could imagine yourself cutting it. Uh, this is not working. Okay, let's see. I'll mute that. And so I'm just going to roll the video because the audio just did something really strange. Um, but this is all B-roll. And here's Ken talking. That's a roll. This is a terrible a roll shot, right? He's looking directly into the camera, and it's, it's just freaky. B roll, B roll, B roll. Let's see if there's any a roll in here. And the whole time, you can imagine him talking underneath it. So what we did was we we, we used to do this old stock market thing where we gave our kids a thousand dollars and they picked out stocks from the newspaper. But what we really wanted to do was improve it. Blah blah blah. And I go back and forth. So using the help of our educational phenom David Boxer, we designed a fully online version and it was totally interactive and now we have graphs and we can do all this crazy stuff. And that's what he's saying under this piece. And um, and we're showing off the technology of the school and everything like that and the whole idea of this video was to um, bolster a capital campaign, an $18 million capital campaign that, um, that the school was doing uh, to build a new learning center. And it worked. I mean, a series of videos like this was compelling enough to get to get those donations ramped up and give people an idea of where the money would be going if they donated and why it was so important to donate. So that's what you're looking at. You run a roll, talk, talk, talk. As soon as you need to cut up what he's saying because he goes off on a tangent or something, boom, you throw down some B-roll with some kids, slice, trim. It's the easiest thing in the world. And um, you're off to the races with creating a nice smooth piece. And you can get out of Dodge in a minute and a half with a nice with a nice piece. Um, do not use cheesy effects. Okay, page turns, uh, clock wipes, uh, glittery things, and lightning bolts and stuff like that are totally unnerving to the viewer and it looks bad. And it really takes a video that, you know, didn't cost a lot to produce and didn't take a lot of time and makes it look like it didn't cost a lot to produce and take a lot of time. So, you know, just don't use cheesy effects. That's just a whole slide just for that. Um, let's get into talking about flip video for a second. Flip video, all it is, is either all A roll or all B roll. That's all it is. It's just easy to digest video because it's either one thing or the other. Um, sometimes people will pull over and ask somebody a question on a flip video, which is kind of like A roll and your B roll, but basically it's one or the other. And this stuff is really robust, and, and everybody's gotten a lot of mileage out of this. If anybody's seen the famous video with all the kids singing and everything and they're they're doing a cappella and it's just straight B roll and it lasts for about thirty seconds and it's very compelling. I mean that's why people like this flip stuff is because it's all so this is an example of a flip being all all A roll. This is a promo piece for a battle of the bands. Um, I recommend that you go back and listen to the audio later because you can see that the kids are really being genuine. And that's the thing. They look like goofy kids um, and stuff like that. But the genuine nature of the way they're saying, please come to our Battle of the Bands, it's all for charity, it's a great event, and everything like that, it, it cuts straight through and straight to the heart. And it really works well. And it shows a compelling side to your students. You know, um, This was shot in like 35 seconds. And then we literally just took it back. And I put a slide in the, you know, a slate in the beginning and a fade at the end. And that was it. That was it. So I mean, flip video can be done well, and it's really compelling. A great thing for flip video, and I'll show you another piece of flip real quick. And this is this is a this is the wrong video. Um, this is a video of some kids hiking up a volcano. Uh, let's see here. 
and basically the, the kids hike up this flaming lava filled volcano every year and there's always good video of it um, and the teacher is actually able to send this back before they got back from the trip so what we did with this is we were able to show what the kids were doing on a day-to-day -day basis by doing a Google map mashup and embedding these videos in the map flags so if you can imagine a map of Guatemala the kids are on this Guatemala trip and every day we put in a new flag of where they are today and what they're doing from the day before totally compelling to the parents you know parents have this wall where they can't see what the kids are doing when they're off at summer camp or whatever here these kids are they're hiking through Guatemala and every day we're able to push content that says what they did the day before the parents were freaking out everybody who was thinking about going on the Guatemala trip the next year was started saving up for the incredible expense and it was you know a huge promo for our you know um, life sciences program and hands-on learning and stuff like that and it was pretty easy I mean the guy just emailed back flip clips that were a minute long and I stuck them into these embedded them in, in, in into these flags that were on this map and it was the whole thing probably took me 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day to manage it and it was hugely impactful so that's what we're talking about when we talk about flip video it's all a roll or all b roll all right let's jump ahead here flip video so so that's what we're talking about and, and it's highly effective and the reason is because um, you know the video is compelling which we'll get into in a second uh, any questions right now I know we covered a lot of ground here but that's exactly um, you know where we wanted to be this is the that's the meat and potatoes of how to use video and produce video um, is there any 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 questions out there um, a couple of people had, um, if we go back just a few slides, more even to the Kins burn effect, can you just explain in greater detail where somebody might find something such as the Kins burn effect, like in what program? Uh, the, the program doesn't do it. What it is is you have to cut it, and that's why I said big dog only. What, um, if you want to see the Kins burn effect, I would just YouTube it, and you'll probably find a good example. Um, but what it is is, um, you've probably seen it before, it looks like the photo is in three dimensions. And what they do is they cut a piece of the background. You know what? I might have a video right at my fingertips on the Windward site that does it. Let me see. I believe it's right. Let's see. So what it is is um, I think it's this one. Let's see. Come on, baby. No. <laughs> Not it. <laughs> Give me one second. I got this here. So what it is is it allows your photos to have multi-dimensionality by um, by layering a still image and moving part of it and not other parts of it. Oh, please let this be the one. No, I don't know where this video was. You can tweet a link out after the after. The yeah, season. that's what we'll do. So we'll keep rolling. But basically, you've seen it before. It's like a still image, and the the camera appears to be panning across the still image, but the the layers, the various degrees of depth in the image have been isolated from one another, and they're moving at different rates. So it appears to be three dimensional. It's very creepy looking. It's called the Ken Ken Burns effect, but it's really it's magical too, and that's what that is about. Um, it, it's it's really hardcore though. If you're going to do that, you have to you, what you have to do is take a photo into Photoshop, cut it into the layers that you want to separate motion for, and then lay a motion effect on every single layer independently. So I can do this with my eyes closed at this point, but that's because I know how to do it. If you're just starting out, I wouldn't do it, but that's how you do that. I hope that answers the question. Um, I'll go find a Ken Burns link and and send it to Maddie later. Um, um, cool. We had another question. Do you talk um, kind of you're referencing editing um, really loosely and you used um, Final Cut Express. What are some other options people might use that you know people have good experience with or have found good results with? Cool. And I, I have slides for this at the end, but I'll just get into it really quick if you want to write it down in this, this part of your notes. Um, there's a huge diversity, right? So it really depends on matching your skill with your it, it depends on matching the editing system with your skill level and ultimately not just your skill level but what your skill level equates to in the amount of time it will take you to use that system so you could go out and buy a twelve thousand dollar avid system and have the most professional gear in the world but if you don't know how to cut on that monster you're gonna spend more time trying to make the system do what you want to do than making good videos right so I have seen 
equally successful videos in the hands of, of practitioners using iMovie, Vegas Video, Pinnacle Studio, um, I prefer Premiere Pro, a lot of people use Final Cut, and of course the professionals all use Avid. So, you know, of those, those are the ones that come to mind offhand. That, that was iMovie, Vegas Video, Pinnacle Studio, um, uh, Premiere Pro and Final Cut, which are on par with each other. It's a style difference. And then Avid, which is the gnarliest of the gnarly professional video platforms, you know, and they have several levels of Avid between Liquid, you know, Video Symphony and, you know, Nitro, all this crazy stuff. So, um, so really it's about selecting an editing program that matches your abilities. And we'll get into the more of that as we get to the end of the, the, the thing. Let's just talk about using students as subjects real quick. Um, students are going to be a little bit harder to shoot because they don't have your strategic goals in mind, right? They're not sitting there going, oh, we're making a video for the donation people. Or, oh, we're making a video to show our parents what we did today. So you may, depending on the maturity level of the kid, you may have to explain to them flat out what the video is for and encourage them to, you know, embellish a lot or whatever. Um, the question came up, Madeline was asking about kids that are quiet. Here's how you avoid that minefield. Don't shoot the kids that are quiet. <laughs> Try to avoid using kids that don't have a natural ability to emote and, or, you know, or who aren't camera shy. Um, because really, it's, it's very hard to recover them. Um, the one way you can get around to it is just by talking to them a lot and by doing the work ahead of time. So what I tend to do is I will go and talk to students about 10 or 20 minutes a day every single day whether I need them on camera or not. Because the reason they're quiet, they're not quiet with each other. They'll gab on for hours and hours. The reason they're quiet is because they find you intimidating. And if you're an authority figure, it's even more difficult to get good video out of them, right? So when I was at Winward, to the best of my ability, I avoided being a person that they saw as somebody who could bring discipline upon them. Okay, If they were on the edge of hurting themselves or doing something dangerous like hanging off the railing or something, of course I would say something as a human being. But you don't want to be seen if you're the content person for the school and you need to use students as a disciplinarian. You know, Don't walk down around campus going, hey, don't do that. Because when you go to shoot video, they're going to be like, this is a mean person and I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> You know, and then also, if you go out there and you spend 10 minutes a day at nutrition or something like that, which I know seems like a lot, or even every other day, getting in the mix and talking it up with the students, or just go to their performances and go up and tell them how cool they are, make jokes, get you know, get them in a comfortable place before you even have to shoot a video. When they see you, they'll be like, "Oh, hey, Mr. So and So," or in my case, Winwood was a first name basis, so it was a lot easier. And they'll say, "Oh, hey, Justin, how's it going? Life's good." Hey, dude, you want to shoot a video? Of course, you're cool. I'm cool. Let's go. You know, you want to be on that kind of level with them to the extent possible within your admin structure because you don't want them to see you as a formidable force or as an authoritarian because they, they won't want to open up to you flat out. They'll shoot. You guarantee you they're going at home on weekends and shooting silly videos of each other all day. It's not that they're afraid of the camera. It's that they're afraid of you. So um, another way not to... <laughs> anger the students if you really want to get good video out of them is not to use a lot of their free time. This is like the biggest thing ever. Um, if you come up to a kid and you're like, hey, you want to, you know, I could really use your, you know, cute face and student perspective on this video I'm doing. Would you like to say a few words to the camera? And even if they're totally into it and they go, oh, yeah, totally. You go, okay, great. I'll see you tomorrow in nutrition or recess or whatever you guys call it. They're going to be like, wait, what? Kids have a packed schedule already. You know, they're, they're told what to do from the minute they wake up till the minute they go to sleep, and they actually, even though it seems like they just mess around a lot, they actually have very little free time. They've got extracurriculars, they've got sports, they've got homework. I mean, it's just other people telling them what to do all the time, and they have very little free time, So, in their minds especially. So if you go up to them and you say, great, I want you to do this thing, oh, by the way, it's going to be during the only, you know, one of the only hour and a half times a day you have free, out of your six-hour day, they're gonna, they're, they're just not gonna like you. And when they get into the, when they get into the interview, which you need to be 20 minutes long, or the full nutrition, or whatever, or lunch, um, especially if it takes longer because they're not quite on board, and you have to shoot them for half an hour instead of 15 minutes, you're just gonna wax their lunch hour, and they're just not gonna be happy about it, and they're not gonna get to eat, and they're gonna be grumpy the rest of the day, and they know that. 
So what will happen is he'll say something like, you know, Devin, that was an amazing football play you made the other day, you know. Tell me about, you know, tell me about the experience of running down the field. And they'll go, uh, it was good. It was good. I just, you know, I ran and I got the ball and I scored. And they'll be looking at their watch and they'll be looking at the clock on the wall just thinking, when can I get out of here? I'm hungry and I want to see my friends. Right? Now look at this way of doing it. Hey, Devin, how's it going, man? Great. Great play the other day. That was crazy. We want to make a video about it. Awesome. So what's, your, what's the class you hate the most? Oh, man, French. I hate French class. Sorry, French teachers. A lot of people hate French class. Man, I hate French class. Great. Can I pull you out of French class tomorrow? Oh, my God, yes. Party on. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> That's what you're looking for. And you'd be surprised. The 15 minutes out of French class will get you better video than an hour and a half of two days worth of lunches because they're excited to be there. And they're like, they feel special, they get pulled out of class, you get to walk into their classroom, you know, obviously you have to confirm this with the teacher first, but you get to walk into the classroom, and you get to say, oh, Devin, come with me today, you're special, and they get stoked about that, and they're already excited by the time they hit the interview chair. That is what you want. You do not want, I'm hungry, I want to go. You want, I'm stoked to be here, and I'll, I'll be here as long as you want me to, because it's better than being in French class. So... That's what we're looking at there. Um, with kids, like I said, they're not going to know your um, plans. So you're going to have to rephrase the question a bunch of times if you don't get it right. This is okay because they won't really notice. You know, same question over. Devin, how, you know, describe the moment you ran down the field. It was great. I got the ball. I ran. I ran it in for a touchdown. Oh, well, explain to me how you outwitted the other team. Well, you just got to be faster than the other guys, man. You got to do this. You got to do that. Boom, I got it. So I might have to ask every question twice, but you'll get the good stuff. Um, in general, they're going to give you less message um, because they're not aware of it. Um, so push for less because, you know, you'll spend all time, all day trying to mine this gold and everything like that. And then finally, I know out here in L.A. we have a lot of celebs, kids, and stuff like that. But even, even if not, you know, this whole taking video of kids thing has gotten really ragged. I always call the parents and let them know you're going to shoot this. If they get the uh, email or the push page or whatever, and they're watching this video and their kid's in it all of a sudden, 99 times out of 100, they're going to be like, oh, cool, they use my kid. But one time they're going to be like, hey, wait a minute, why wasn't I informed? I'm a helicopter parent. I'm coming after you. Um, so that's it. That is the entire nugget on how to, you know, how to get this stuff done on a ground level. Um, the key points here, I'll just go over them one more time. And A roll, you know, use gentle commands, don't ask any questions, shoot off angle. You know, so it's not creepy to look at the video. Um, B-roll, shoot an hour of B-roll for every minute of usable video you want to use, unless it's something really simple, and then you can get away with a half an hour. So if you, if you know what they're going to say, and they said it already in the A-roll, and you need to go in and cover the shots, still, this will feel like a giant waste of time. And if you have a boss, they'll make seem like it's a huge waste of time. But here's what happens. Let's say you've got a two-minute video. You shoot two hours of B-roll, that's two class periods. You're gone for two class periods on a, on a, on a Monday. You shoot 20 minutes of A-roll, takes you about 15 minutes to set up, five minutes to break down, so you're looking at 40 minutes. Total time spent on this video, three hours. You get into the edit room, and you can cut it using your favorite editing software because you really know how to use it. you got a ton of source material, and you can find the shots you need, cut it down, add your titles, and put the music in and everything, and it'll, it'll take you between two and four hours. Total time spent on project, about seven to eight hours. That's one day, okay? Seems like a lot, but you spread it out over the course of the whole week. If you don't have good source material, drilling for the right shot when you notice, oh, that kid's picking his nose in the background. That's not going to work. Oh, we've got too much glare off the window there. You will never, in school shooting in uncontrolled conditions, be able to measure everything that's going on in the shot before you get into the edit room. It'll be like you never watched the video before your life and you've been standing there shooting it. So what ends up happening is that shot doesn't work. Oh, now I've got to go leave and shoot it some more. Now this is going on. Well, this teacher's busy today, even though I scheduled him the other day and I missed what I needed in, in A-roll. So I've got to shoot him again, but this time they're skip booked for the rest of the week. So now we've got to go to next week. Video's on deadline for the week after that. This happens. Oh, this kid's not in school anymore, so now the shots don't match. Okay, so that's no good. Boom. The next thing you know, you've spent like two weeks trying to get a two-minute video off the ground, but it could have taken you basically, you know, the one day spread out over three, three calendar days, and it'll look bad. So I can't stress enough, 
invest in the beginning and then get better stuff after that. Okay, those are the two big things. Don't use cheesy effects and uh, cut the music. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about how this stuff fits in with the strategy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because I think everybody pretty much gets it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having a webinar. Um, it's a lot more viral than written material. People will share videos more easily. Everybody knows that the number one media that engages, um, medium that engages on Facebook is video. So video works. It works across platforms. You can put it on a Facebook page. You can put it in an email push page. You can, you know, do a QR code link in a printed document. I mean, it's just really versatile. It travels far, and it's easy for people to digest, and they, they appreciate multimedia over a much more written text. A well-produced video, very, very emotional. Um, so you can really, I mean, you know, people will ball their eyes out behind their computer screens if you if you get something that's really intense, you know, a kid that's overcome adversity or, you know, whatever. Um, stuff like that is really intense. And, and it's also rich. Um, like I said, it's, it's a lot of information, right? Video transmits a lot more information for every frame than photography and writing will ever do. It really gets the point across as to what's going on. And it allows people to understand, which at this point, you know, especially if you're a social media fan, you know that engagement is the name of the game, right? It's all about making people feel an emotional connection to your content. And we're using all kinds of elaborate methods to do that now, Facebook photos, you know, funny stuff, serious stuff mixed together. And, you know, if you know what's good for you, you mix your message in with the dog food and people come to the site for good content and while they're eating the content, your message is mixed in there like a pill and they swallow it and boom, you get your objectives across to your higher ups, right? So video is good for this because you can you can make a message where a kid says, "Boy, I wish I had better a better chemistry lab." And next thing you know, everybody's like, "Oh my God, we've got to get Timmy a new chemistry lab right away." Checks are flying to the donation, you know, to the development department. So that's why they like that because it, it functions and it, it functions well. Um, one time, David Boxer, who was the guy in the pink shirt in that Ken Asher video, that stock market video, um, he told me once that you know it. It's, it's going to be very important. He was on the director level, and I was just a, like a coordinator. And he said, it's going to be really important for you, Justin, to let everybody know that video is the golden apple. That's what he said. He's like, if you, you know, when you start to get into doing this, you are already stressed out, and people are not going to understand, as they already don't, what it takes to do your job. And so they're going to think that you can just whip these videos out no problem. And what you're going to have is a monster that gets harder and harder to feed as they want more elaborate videos, more people involved. You know, they're going to try to stuff seven people into a two-minute video, got to tell them it's not happening. The message of this bullet point, the golden apple, is to right now, before you ever cut a single video, begin to manage expectations, right? Always make it a trade-off because in reality, you don't have any more time of the day. So when your admin comes up to you and says, I want a video, and you go, okay, great, here's what we're going to lose or that means I'll have to spend less time doing this, or whatever. You want to start managing those expectations up front, because if you get into a situation where you've got a beast that wants video, and they think you can do everything you're, you, do on, you did last year, plus a huge layer of video on top of it all, and you're going to have no problems, it's going to be like pouring a gallon of water into a shot glass. You're going to spill, and it's going to look bad for you, which is totally crazy, but that you know that's what will happen. So when video starts up and people are getting really into this and the next thing you know the board's like, hey, let's just do a video for every single thing on campus, be, be sure that when they come asking for that sort of stuff, you're really managing expectations, um, you know, and, and make sure. There's also non-strategic video. So you can do stuff that isn't out there with a goal that just helps the school kind of move along. Um, you know, like I have instructional vids here, online lectures, special events. This stuff's actually really easy to do. Um, you know, there's a whole other talk which is all about live streaming component. Um, that stuff's really cool. So when I talk about special events on alumni outreach, we're mostly talking about live streaming. Um, so that's really easy, right? You just set up a camera and push go and it's streaming this event live and there's no editing whatsoever. You just sit there like a monkey behind the board. Um, but these not strategic videos are pretty easy and they can make your life easier in other ways. I had a director of technology at Marymount Academy in Beverly Hills over there makes these screencasts of how to set up email accounts and stuff. And it's like step-by-step -step explanation of how to do it. And, um, and that way when people call, 
and they say, how do I set up my email? He sends them a YouTube link or whatever, and they're out of his hair. So, I mean, this stuff can save you time, and it's just another way to think about it. Um, okay, so finally, let's just get into the starter kit, what you need exactly to get it all going. Um, obviously, you're going to need a camera. You're going to need some kind of audio enhancement, and I'll get to that in a second. And then you're going to need video editing software. That's basically it. Um, so cameras, there's a huge variety out there now, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's um, HD hard disk cameras, which basically shoot directly to a, um, a hard drive in the camera, and then you dump it into the computer. There's flip cameras, and there's DSLR cameras, which are digital cameras that are meant to shoot photos, but they also have a video thing. Um, those are shoot beautiful, beautiful video, but there's a catch, and I'll get to it in a second. The main takeaway for your camera is no more tapes. We are done with doing tapes because tapes are time consuming. You shoot it on tape, and then you have to flow the video into the machine in real time analog, and it's just kills. It just absolutely kills. And for school video, there is just no reason to go to a tape format anymore. You want it to be quick and dirty. You want to plug your camera into your computer, start the file transferring over, and then start answering emails while the files are drifting and not and save yourself time. Um, camera transfers, they, they take up the entire computer. You can't do anything else if you're doing tape transfer. So just don't get anything with tape on it. Other than that, consumer versus professional, I'm telling you, when I'm in a school environment, I don't shoot professional. There's too many knobs on that thing. There's too many things you can forget to set. Too much stuff can go wrong. If you're a hardcore and you were a professional shooter and you want to use your same gear because that's faster for you because you are more comfortable with it, I would do it. Other than that, if you're just starting out, find a good consumer cam because in the end of the day, the video is getting compressed from the web anyway and it will hardly make a difference. Hardly. Um, but yeah, so go tapeless. Um, consumer versus professional, definitely shoot consumer. And then um, keep in mind the kind of accessories that you might want to use down the road. So when you're selecting a camera, make sure that if you're going to go with a certain camera, that it will also accommodate other things that you think you like. You know, don't get a flip camera if you want to use a hardcore tripod or a, you know, some kind of steadying rig or something like that. You know, just be aware of what environments you want to shoot in and what toys you want to add on. Um, I'll circle back on the DSLR thing real quick. The issue with DSLR is that when you're shooting pops the mirror up out of the way of the the video receiving sensor in the camera, right? So you hit, normally you, you, you push down your thing halfway, it auto focuses, and then you snap and you hit a camera, and like cameras have been doing since the 70s, the mirror flickers and boom, it's exposed to the sensor now instead of film, and you get this image. In DSLR cameras, to my knowledge, they still do this, only the auto-focusing brain, which is in the top part of the camera, if you're looking at this slide and you can see my mouse, is right there, is covered by the mirror when the sensor has to stay open to record video. What this means is this Nikon D90 will shoot the most beautiful, you know, digital video and the most compact Kodak you've ever seen. No need to know what that means. But it'll shoot beautiful video and a very conservative file size. But you have to pull your own focus. And that is difficult. <laughs> You know, so you, you do in manual focus. So if you can find a DSLR with autofocus, I would do that because it's, you can use it as your camera. You don't have to switch formats. It'll take all the tripod stuff. It has interchangeable lenses. You can shoot, you know, crazy telephoto if you're doing sports or whatever. But as far as I know, auto, you know, it's only manual focus, which basically sets you back to the, the days of, like, you know, shooting movies in the 80s. I mean, it's hardcore. Like, pulling manual focus is no joke. So just be aware of that. Um, here we are talking again about video editing software. I basically gave you all the, the, the goods, but here's a slide. Um, it's, there's various types of editing software. with, with all They all do the same thing at the end of the day. They take different clips of video. They turn them into one big fat clip of video with some audio underneath it, and they crap out one file, at, and you put that on the Internet. So what you want to do is go after one that is the most comfortable for you to use. So, yeah, this is all of what I just said before, yeah. The skills, your skills, and how what that equates to in time are will, what will affect your software choice. Just know that at the end of the day, if you go for an easier thing like iMovie or something like that, you're going to have fewer options when it comes to more advanced things down the line. 
So you'll get into the situation if you get good at cutting video. You know, three years ago, Hans and Dahl was posting around on iMovie, and now he's doing crazy, I mean, just crazy advanced video stuff, um, all in the consumer space, which just blows me away. Um, and the reason is because he, he picked platforms that, that grew with him, right? So the two slides I have here, they show a timeline-based editing system, right? The video and the audio tracks are all on this timeline. At the very minimum, I would start there because eventually you're going to liberate yourself into more and more elaborate videos and you you won't be able to jump the gap to a more professional piece of software unless you're doing something with a timeline. That doesn't do you any favors if we're talking iMovie. But, you know, I actually use both. So I'll do iMovie for like quickies or something I just need to do really quick. But in general, even if you do use iMovie, I would go find a piece of, you know, trial software that allows you to play with this timeline thing because if you try to, if you want to hit that later, it'll be a tough curve to make in the middle of the school year um, when you're feeling limited. Um, <clears throat> so just in general, yeah, you want to take the piece of software. Here's what you do if you don't have any editing software. Download every single free trial you can. Even the most professional software has free trial. So Final Cut, Premiere Pro, all that, download the free trial. It's a month long and play with every single one and then just delete the ones you don't like and buy the full version of the one you do. That's how you deal with editing software. Uh, last bit here is audio enhancement. Um, it turns out that audiences will watch really rough video, but they won't watch rough audio. It's very difficult for them to listen to. I don't know why, but bad audio is really repugnant, and they will stop watching that video right in the middle. YouTube has a thing where it shows you where people stop watching so you can figure out what went wrong. B videos with bad audio, man, as soon as that even gets a little bit annoying, people just stop watching. They can't stand it. Shaky video, people are used to the Internet and video quality being up and down all over the place now. So I used to preach, oh, you've got to get this beautiful video, otherwise it'll look unprofessional. That's not true anymore. Now you can shoot the crappiest video you've ever seen, totally jumbly, totally handheld. You can let the students run wild with the camera, and people will sit there and take it, but they will not handle bad audio. So what this you know, young woman has on her camera is a, is a mic extension for her Sony. Um, you know, it's all good. I would, you know, find a way to enhance your audio and make sure you're getting clean audio. Some cameras shoot clean audio naturally. Just, just make sure you're getting good audio because if you don't, it'll just, it'll just undermine everything you do. Um, the last part is external storage. I'm not going to say a lot about this, but basically I would back up your videos to other things. If you put the video that you're cutting on the computer that you're cutting it on, this just always happens. It just bogs the computer down bad. So store the video off, and what this will allow you to do is if somebody, if your computer goes down, and you're in the middle of cutting a piece, all the project files are on this external hard drive, just go across campus to somebody else's video computer. You know, if they use Final Cut on campus and you have Final Cut in your office and your, you know, your computer explodes, you can take your external hard drive and plug it into another computer with the same editing software or just download the trial version on another computer on campus of whatever software you're using and you can finish your piece. And that will, you know, that will save your skin. And then you can figure out what happened with your desktop computer later. So if your stuff is all stuck on the hard drive inside your internal computer, you'll never get it out. So I always store my stuff outside. Um, so that's it. I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff you can do, accessory software. I'm just going to leave this slide on here so you can look it over. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff has been taken care of in years past. You know, you can, sound editing software will give you better music cuts. Compression software will give you more options when it comes to outputting. Um, and then DVD authoring software will allow you to press DVDs probably have all that stuff now anyway, but I just thought I'd throw that on there. Um, and this is, this is it. This is the, this is the uh, conclusion of the whole thing. It's basically, you know, you can add a video component in that will improve any communication scheme, but, and you can do it quickly and, and with very little cost. I think the upstart is between $800 and $1,500 for all this gear and all this stuff. And to produce videos at that rate is very, very good. So, um, you know, just make sure that you're managing expectations and keep that, keep the amount of time it takes you to do a video reserved when people ask you for one. Because if they start to cut down on the amount of time you have, you're going you're gonna to run off the rails there. And, um, but in general, you'd be surprised how much you can get done with, you know, one or two days a month spread out over the course of a week. Um, you, can, you can make some pretty compelling stuff 
and it will have a huge impact and it will make you campus famous. Like people will be stoked that you're out there with your video camera and stuff because they know that it's high impact. And you know, every department on campus will love you for showcasing them and the, and the admin departments on campus like admissions and development will love you for making their jobs easier by, you know, providing prospective students with something to look at that's more interesting than text and photos and by providing pr prospective donors with a way to tangibly feel where their where their donations are going. Um, and that is all. Uh, that's all I got. If anybody has any questions, um, I'm all in favor of taking them. I know we're hitting the hour right right on, maybe a little bit over. So I'll put up my contact information, and um, you can you know feel free to call me or whatever anytime. I basically just hang out and and answer questions like this all day. It's literally what I do. So um, you know if it's nothing major, it's not a whole project or a whole overhaul. I'll, I'll, I'm more than happy to answer questions and uh, shoot emails back and forth to anybody that's just getting started because I was there at one point and I had help too. So um, if there aren't any questions, thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, what I learned with you. Thank you very much, Justin. Thanks so much for sharing um, your video clips throughout the day. A couple of people had a question about um, if you could share the link with us for um, that map mashup that when we're did with their videos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah cool. So that, that's, that'd be um, great. As long as I fill the screen, I'll show you where it is. It's winnerschool.org slash cool. And even if we tweet it out to us, that that would be very helpful. And I can okay. um, I can retweet that to our followers with the hashtag. So yeah, thanks very much for taking the time to put that together. Um, it was a great presentation. And if there are any other questions that we didn't completely answer for you, feel free to contact either Justin or us um, at Ed Social Media. And um, our next in-person event is at Loomis Chafee in Connecticut on January 12th. So we'll spend the day creating and sharing content in an uh, Ed Social Media Boot Camp. So um, our next webinar is scheduled for January 10th with Cassie Dole of Park Tudor School in Indianapolis. She will discuss how to manage online marketing in 40 hours a week. So um, for those folks that have been tuning into our webinar series, I think that'll be a great one to catch as well. Thanks again for attending our free webinar. A special thanks to our webinar sponsors, Admissions Quest and Proof, for supporting this event. And I think that's all for today. So many thanks for tuning in, and we always invite feedback. Um, feel free to email info at edsocialmedia.com with anything you'd like to mention. Um, and hopefully we'll see many of you at the turn of the year. Thanks again. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Madeline. Talk to you later.